We are now going to be uh, taken by three uh, speakers that we have invited uh, today. Uh, normally, it's either Pastor Jan and I preaching uh, Sabbath after Sabbath or Sunday after Sunday. Uh, but uh, always on Good Friday, I enjoy very, very much hearing from God's people and not from us. And so uh, today we are doing something different than what we've done previous uh, years. And we have invited three of our people to bring to us a word. And we're going to go up a mountain. We're going to go to Calvary. And we're going to take a look together at the three crosses that stand at Calvary and those people who hang there. And when they came to the place which is called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. I, a woman, will try to show you why the thief, a man, may have rejected Jesus on the cross. I will try to speak for and about him from guidance of the word of the scriptures. There's nothing mentioned about him other than he was a thief on the cross. Who was he? What was his name? No one says. No one knows. You may say that no one cares. Is this why he may have become a thief? Please follow with me for a moment as I become that thief on the cross. My name is Chuck and my name means to reject. I am the thief on the cross. I was thrown out of the house to fend for myself at a very early age. I lived in caves and ate by any means possible. I stole from older ladies as I offered to help them. I would take things from the marketplace when the merchants were distracted. I wanted so badly to be part of something I accepted the invitation from a group who told me that they cared. They showed me this by praising me by the amount I could steal and bring back to them. I had heard several times from several people that love is a decision, it's my decision, and I did not have to steal and do the bad things. But I responded that this life was the one I had chosen. But why would I, and why did I deny Jesus? Look, here I am hanging on the cross, suffering excruciating pain along with Jesus and the other thief. Both the other thief and I joined the crowd below in their mockery and insults towards Jesus. We were pretty vile. Have you become so delirious from pain that sometimes you say things that are just not repeatable? Maybe that's what we were. We were just delirious. So why is this happening to the other thief and I? What's going on? Now my friends had told me never to accept promises from anyone because they would always disappoint. Am I recognizing something here? I say to myself, Chuck, are you nuts? 
How can you insult and revile him as you are literally hanging so closely with him? Are the others below going to take you down and nurse you back to health? Are they helping you? Come on, they're not. They're now laughing at you because you were the one that was caught and chosen to die. They're watching as the blood flows from your feet and your hands. They hear your shoulders snap as they dislocate, as your arms are stretched out. The grinding of your disjointed bones from the pressure of the weight on your soon to be lifeless body on your knees. Your chest deflating as your breathing becomes shallow. They're watching and laughing as any sign of life leaves your body. They'll walk away at dusk and leave your dead body for the vultures to rip to shreds. Yet this man, though he's hanging on the cross next to me, is suffering and asking God for mercy for me. I can hear him calling out to me. I can hear him pray for my forgiveness. And I ask myself, what am I missing? You see, I couldn't believe that he, Jesus the Messiah, was hanging and experiencing the death that is meant for criminals like me. I felt as some people do that you must see something happen to believe it. So the other thief and I said to Jesus, come on, you're the Messiah, save yourself and us. Now, I might not have doubted if he had come down and taken us down. I could have accepted that, but he didn't. We're still hanging there. The others are saying he's a fraud. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I just have some doubts, and they're big ones. I just have that same doubt that you and I so often have, just because we do not get what we want. He doesn't give us that answer. He wouldn't just save himself because he didn't need to. I didn't know that. I was so blinded, even though I'm hanging there dying, I couldn't see anything clearly. I had been rejected by that same crowd that I hung with, therefore what else could there be? I'm too proud to submit even to the one who calls himself the Messiah. Why would I believe? I will die on my own. How many times do you and I reject Jesus? Our faith becomes shallow or weak with certain situations. We reject or throw people away because we do not take the time. We dismiss them when things become tough. We dismiss God when he doesn't give us the answer we want. We cannot see love when true love is offered. The opportunity is always there, but we're always just so quick to close the door. We do not trust enough. Jesus holds out his hand and we slap it. Does any of this sound familiar? Is this what happened to Chuck? Brothers and sisters, I'm not immune. I know, I know rejection, and I know about being rejected. There were times that I felt so rejected that I rejected anyone who would attempt to offer me love. But fortunately, I stand here before you tonight because I finally, I finally accept that love. What or who are you rejecting today? Are you being rejected by someone that you love? Are you hesitant to make that phone call or that visit because of the possible reaction or a greeting? Even in our pain, when a hand or prayer is given us, we reject for fear of being disappointed or hurt. 
Our pride always gets in the way of receiving what God wants us to have. The world rejects us in so many ways every moment of every day. When you try to share the gospel, the killing of your dreams and hopes, love, compassion. Right now there's something or someone in your life that you are rejecting or you are being rejected. But Jesus did not reject the poor. He did not reject the lonely, the sick, the unloved. He rejected no one, even the ones who are crucifying him. He does not disappoint or hurt. He does not leave us hanging. When the rejection is given, he is there to hold us up and show us that he loves us. What a beautiful picture, yet painful to see the rich red blood of Jesus flowing, knowing that I will never be rejected by him and that he loves me so. The word of God, the holy scriptures, prayer, faith, it takes us to a place of assurance and a reassurance. Oh, how wonderful if Chuck, the thief on the cross, could see and believe that Jesus Christ cared for him. So think about this. Are you carrying this cross? What is your rejection today? The Cross of Acceptance. Two criminals, one savior, all three of them charged for the worst of crimes. Two guilty, but one repented. What's interesting about the savior is that he was taking the punishment for the very crimes that these thieves were being punished for. Sadly, Jesus was treated as a criminal and was condemned in the midst of them. Though there may be sin on the left, sin on the right, the power to overcome is in the centrality of Jesus Christ. But this narrative is for the cross of acceptance regarding the criminal who repented. Let's pray. Father God, as I attempt to speak on this cross, Lord, I ask that they would be your words and not my own. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The criminal who accepts Jesus realizes something of a divine revelation. Three out of four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John, slightly touch the surface that Christ was condemned to die to, next to two thieves. But St. Luke gives us a bit more light into the situation. He records in St. Luke 23. I'm gonna read from verse 39 just for some context. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered rebuking him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Our main, our, our main character is the criminal who accepted Christ. Who was he? Some Greek cultures call him Dismas. In Syriac infancy gospel calls him Titus. In the Russian tradition, the good thief's name is Rach, whatever his name. This type of robber was notoriously dangerous and would do just about anything, including kill for his devious gains. So why did he accept Jesus? Perhaps he saw something of the majesty of God the love shining out of the eyes of the Messiah right next to him. I believe there are two main reasons that this criminal accepted the cross, accepted Jesus. 
He accepted who he was, firstly, and secondly, he accepted who he needed. And just to emphasize a little bit more on the first part, number one, accepted who he was, he saw his need. He realized he's stuck, literally stuck to a cross. He's in a rut. Ever been, been, ever been in a bad situation yourself that you couldn't get out of? When we are, Christ is there with us. Number two, he accepted who he needs. He saw the power and compassion in the selfless Christ for guilty sinners. Imagine that amazing grace close up. He's right next to the Savior, the most valuable friend. Christians, as Christians, we proclaim him. But this criminal, this, this, this thief, got a front row seat to this grace. Isn't that powerful? That cross may be painful at times for us when we have to go through our own type of crosses. The consequences may be real, but there is nothing better than to hang next to Jesus. It wasn't until I saw that dragon tattoo on the back of that 14-year-old kid. I saw the depths to where I was. I was at a party I shouldn't have been at, hanging with people I shouldn't have been talking with. At that time, I was in high school. And mom was praying. She was praying a lot because of where I was at that stage of my life and my experience. And for some reason, as I saw that tattoo on this 14-year-old child, it hit me. What, what am I doing with my life? Is that something that I want to be participating in? It just didn't seem right. I don't know why, but it felt wrong. And maybe the thief on the cross was at that stage as well. He saw to the depths of where he had sunk and said, is this the rock bottom? I saw my need of a higher power to help me. And it was that very night where I found Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior as well. And, and talking about acceptance, since that's what this cross is all about, it wasn't until that incredible moment for the thief, until that moment he accepted the grace of Jesus. Are we accepting that grace today? Allowing it to transform us more and more into Jesus every day? Let's let God fill us completely and fill us. What do you say? The accepting thief then says the famous line that resonates even with my own heart. Remember me. Remember me in your kingdom that day. Remember me in your will and in your way. He accepted last minute. Yeah, it was last minute. God is God and he can accept his last minute too. I've seen it happen. But if we see his goodness and his grace today, why delay? Let's tell God, remember me today, Jesus. There were signs leading up to his acceptance. He was also defending Jesus from false accusation from the other thief, as was mentioned so eloquently and beautifully. Another sign was that he was of a humble attitude before Christ. That, that goes a long way when we're dealing with God, that humility. That's something that Lucifer lacked. When we accept Christ, it is his spirit that leads us up to the repentance of sin. The, this was definitely a sign that the Lord was working on his heart prior to that event, and maybe God was just leading perfectly up to that event. It just... It just it's so beautiful as I was just listening to that scripture reading of the story of Abraham of is willing to give up his own son. He's going up the hill and maybe God is leading him up to that point of faith, of, of sacrifice. But on the other side of that hill, God is leading up a ram to take place atonement for that sacrifice. Isn't that powerful? What about us? What about me? How easy has Christ made his gift available to us? All he asks is for us to accept it. Just two simple words. Easy to, easy to say, right? Sometime, sometimes friends reject us. Family, maybe companies, job offers, even our ambitions can maybe get rejected. But when the world rejects us, Christ always accepts us. God's grace is incredible when we deserve punishment. Jesus has done nothing wrong, but he took that punishment for you and for me. 
Why are you guys treating him that way? This is the Messiah. The criminal said, Lord, when you return to earth, remember me in that resurrection. Jesus answers, you can be with me today. Why do you need to wait? Why delay? That same gift is available to us, not only in that great day of the Lord, but today. Today is the day of salvation. If we receive him, today we shall be with him in paradise. Why? Because Jesus is paradise. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The cross of grace. How do you define that? I'll get to that in a minute. We just heard about two thieves crucified alongside Jesus. One a, pen a penitent man and the other rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. Even while the Lord was experiencing physical, emotional, and perhaps even spiritual agony, he had the compassion to listen to the plea of one in need. He made the effort to suppress his own pain in answer to the needs of a sinner. He promised that man that that very day he would be with him in paradise. Imagine that. The circumstances of the thieves were very similar. Both had been crucified. Both were wicked men. Both were most likely angry. And both were in excruciating pain. So why did only one of them have a change of heart? And why did the other remain the same? Unfortunately, the thief that rejected Christ is symbolic of the world we live in today. There are those that accept the promise of Jesus but many more who don't. The unrepentant thief certainly wasn't concerned with Jesus. He was concerned with himself, which is the greatest concern of most people who don't know Christ. Imagine those who reject Christ and choose to send, spend an eternity in hell, even though the cross that saves stands as close as an arm's length away. The people that come up to the throne of grace. They come right up to the throne of grace, yet fail to take part in his promise. Our common people like you and me, people from all walks of life. And when people put down or make fun of the Christian faith, they are no different than this unrepentant thief. The rejection of Christ is often not so much of the mind, but of the will. Not so much I can't, but I won't. Often people refuse to accept Christ because they'll have to stop committing that certain sin and they don't want to stop. To find God and accept Jesus would be a very inconvenient experience for them because it involves rethinking their whole outlook on life. There's a saying that goes like this. We do not find because we do not seek. And we do not seek because we do not want to find. So have you ever considered the question, why did Christ have to die? The answer may seem simple, and yet so many miss the point of his sacrifice entirely. In fact, many believe they're Christians simply because they've been baptized or confirmed. Many believe they're Christians because they attend church on a regular basis. Still others think that they must do good works or act like a Christian in order to become one. These are all appropriate and certainly virtuous. However, they're not what makes one a Christian. Christ died on the cross, not so that you'd have to attend church every Sunday and check the attendance box, 
or even help that old neighbor of yours unload their groceries, all for the sake of working your way toward eternal life. Christ died for a very real and intentional purpose, to give us eternal life at no cost to us. Zero cost. Grace is one of those things that can't be forced. It's a free offering that extends beyond what we deserve. It mercifully holds back what we should have coming to us. Grace stands with welcoming arms. Grace accepts with a wide open heart. But don't forget that grace, although free, is not cheap. It was paid for fully and completely by Jesus. Grace doesn't turn a blind eye toward our sin. It provides one to bear that sin. Grace doesn't ignore justice. It punishes a substitute. Grace doesn't sweep our misdeeds under a rug. It covers them over with the blood of Christ. Grace is not about compromise. It's about the cross. Now comes the tough part. The cross of Christ is evidence of God's undeniable goodness and grace and of our unquestionable corruption and unworthiness. If we were just morally neutral, then there would be nothing amazing about God's grace. When we elevate ourselves and our worthiness, we denigrate and undermine the wonder of God's grace toward us. As a people, how have we reassured ourselves that we're worthwhile? We might say, Christ died for us, and look at the price he paid. We were worth dying for, right? Well, the amazing truth is that Christ died for utterly unworthy people. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. To minimize our unworthiness, by emphasizing our value is to minimize the redemptive work of Christ on our behalf. The fact that Christ died for us is never offered in scripture as proof of our value as wonderful people, but as a demonstration of his profound love. So profound a love that he would die for broken people like you and me. The enormous price of our redemption the shed blood of God, is a testimony not to how good we are, but to how bad we really are. If we hadn't have been so bad, perhaps a lower price would have been sufficient. The higher the price, however, the greater the testimony to our brokenness and the greater the testimony of the amazing love of God. And because of God's grace, we can feel good about what God has done for us and in us and to us. We don't need to worry about ceasing to deserve God's grace because we never deserved it in the first place. <laughs> we don't have to fear becoming unworthy of him precisely because we were never worthy of him. We are forever secure in the love of Christ as we could never be if our relationship with him depended on our own worth. Yes, he does love us, but in a way that fully credits him, not us. The cross of Christ is the signature symbol of the central event in the history of civilization. The resurrection of Christ was the event that accomplished salvation and verified Christ's victory over death. But it was the cross of Jesus that showed us the grace of God. Everything that God wants us to know about himself comes together on the cross. And our entire purpose in life is to elevate the cross. Think about Jesus nailed to the cross. In your mind's eye, picture him stretched out against the sky and ask yourself, what's he doing up there? Well, the answer is he's subbing for you and me. He's taking God's wrath for our sin. He's satisfying the just demands of a holy God. He's paying the price that God's holiness requires so that you and I can be forgiven. In the place where our blood should have stained the ground, Jesus hung as our substitute. 
See, we can't really understand the gospel until we understand this idea of substitution. Jesus' death was in the place of every person who's ever lived. You, me, and everyone else. Each of us deserves to die in punishment for our own sin. But Jesus stepped in and took that penalty for us. Why did Jesus have to die? He was the son of God. He had all authority on earth and in heaven. Yet he died a cruel and excruciating death. Why? Well, the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This verse answers the why of the cross. His sacrifice, his blood, is a ratification of the covenant of grace to all true believers. If Christ had not shed his blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. It was through his death that we reestablished our relationship with God. So Jesus had to die. He had to shed his blood. In his blood is a forgiveness of sins. And in Christ, we already have it. The death of Jesus is the way of forgiveness. Yes, he died to do the will of his Father. He shed his blood to forgive our sins. All of them, past, present, and future, forgiven. Amid all that pain and suffering, Jesus takes time on the cross to ensure us of this. In the midst of his pain and agony, he still thought of us because there was no other way. If there were anyone who knew what God was like, it would have been God in the flesh, Jesus. If there were anyone who knew how not to sin, it was a sinless one, Jesus. If there were anyone who knew how to love and serve other people, it was the one who came to die for sin, Jesus. In every moment of Jesus' life, he was fulfilling, trusting, and obeying the word of God. An eternal life with God is a gift from God. That's why Jesus died for us. Remember this. When you're feeling alone, Jesus too felt alone on that cross for us. When you're suffering from physical, physical pain and illness, Jesus too suffered in his body for us. When your spirit is wandering and God is hard to find, Jesus felt that same isolation for us. At some point in our lives, there's a choice each of us has to make. The question is, will you reject him or will you embrace his grace? Amen.